good morning. Um, can I ask you to please um, sit down so that we can start? Um, good morning. My name is uh, Samah Wahba. I'm the Global Director for uh, Urban Development, Disaster Risk Management, Resilience, and Land at the World Bank. And it's my real pleasure to be able to welcome you all over here for this uh, sixth edition of the Urbanization and Poverty Reduction uh, Research Conference. So this is <clears throat> an event that we organize every year to discuss and debate urban issues. Um, as you know, cities um, are housing today about 55% of the global population, and they're responsible for somewhere in the vicinity of 80% of global GDP, and they're associated with poverty uh, reduction, so urbanization and poverty reduction tend to go hand in hand. So in this regard, this conference is a particularly unique forum because it brings together both urban researchers and policy makers to have a dialogue, and our role is really to facilitate the dialogue between uh, the two. And we do this, and we believe it's important because, of course, applied research, specifically regarding urban issues, needs to shed light on the big policy challenges faced by city, and vice versa, we believe that urban researchers can also generate really useful insights uh, to guide policies and um, that are relevant to accompany urbanization and urban development. And in this regard, we have an excellent lineup that spans both researchers and policymakers uh, for this dialogue. Let me start first by inviting Art Cray, who is the director of the World Bank's research department, DEC, to say a few words about the importance of urban economics research and the role of this conference in stimulating this research. Art, over to you. Thanks very much, Same. And um, I'd like to join you also in welcoming everybody here today um, in, uh, as uh, incoming uh, or new director of the research department. I think this uh, conference is a great illustration of how uh, the World Bank can really play a catalytic role in bringing together policymakers, researchers um, interested in some of the most important questions that, uh, that face us um, in the world of development policy. I don't need to tell anybody here about how the world is urbanizing and continuing to urbanize rapidly. By the middle of the century, something like two-thirds of the world's population will live in cities. And so what matters in cities matters. It's as simple as that. Um, and moreover, in areas uh, like urban economics and urban policy, perhaps more than in other areas, the persistent and very, very long-term effects of policies is extremely marked. So getting them right is important, and policies that we get wrong will conversely have very persistent adverse effects. Policy decisions that affect the development of cities and the lives of people who live in cities need to be informed by solid research decisions, and that's or, or solid underlying research. And that's one of the reasons for organizing conferences like this, so that we can get together, discuss and debate some of the newest research findings, and more importantly, think through what they mean for policy. However, um, in the world of urban economics research has been evolving rapidly, particularly in, uh, as, uh, as it relates to issues in developing countries. Um, when this conference first got started six years ago, it was a much smaller cast of characters who were working on it. There was much less policy discussion around it. And so much more um, needs to be done and much more has been done over the past um, six years, uh, both in terms of research and policy work in the bank and in the wider development community. Uh, there are a number of factors that have led to sort of a, a, um, a resurgence and an expansion of interest in these areas. Of course, we have this long-term trend of taking seriously economic geography and the spatial organization of production and how that matters for the development of cities, their shapes, their boundaries, and what occurs within them. A second trend that has been um, very important, particularly in recent years, is this explosion of uh, availability of new types of data that can shed light on policy questions. So, <clears throat> including big data from sensors, satellite imagery, social media, cell phone records, and many other kinds. You know, data by itself, of course, is uh, not a very interesting object. And in parallel with the development of these new data sources, there's been increasing development of tools to be able to analyze them for policy insight. 
You know, a very simple example, of course, is the use of artificial intelligence algorithms to be able to automatically classify images in order to be able to better um, uh, discern patterns in, line, in land use at sort of high, very high levels of resolution within cities, knowing where slums are and where slums are not, and so on. So this kind of data has great potential for um, both improving the quality of research we do and ultimately for improving the quality of policy advice. Um, this edition of the conference um, has a theme, markets, peoples, and, sorry, markets, people, and cities, uh, with the idea of focusing on issues relating to human capital. Again, this is not um, a stretch by any, uh, any stretch of the imagination. When you think about the very large share of the world's population that will be living in cities, the incentives and the opportunities to for them to invest in their human capital is going to have pr uh, profound implications for, um, uh, for development. Um, as, uh, as some of you know, I've been involved quite a bit with the World Bank's um, work in the past year or so on, uh, on the Human Capital Index, and one of the um, things that we've been working on since its launch last year is to look more carefully at subnational and other disaggregations of the index. And one of the things that is very striking, of course, from this, and also probably not very surprising, are the huge disparities that we see in investments in human capital of the young across geographical regions, and particularly between rural and urban regions. And this, you know, continues to bring forward old questions about poor people versus poor places, whether it makes more sense to bring services to people and people to services. These issues are gaining sort of, uh, th these issues are no less important when they were first raised 20 and 30 years ago in the policy discussion. And there's great scope with the uh, advances in, in new data and new technologies for analyzing this data to uh, be able to shed new insights into them. Finally, I just want to say one, um, you know, slightly bureaucratic but nevertheless important thing, which is how um, I, uh, you know, how I see this conference as an excellent example of how um, the different parts of the World Bank and the wider academic and development community can work together to generate sound research and sound ideas to give good policy advice. Um, the one of the key roles of the research department in the World Bank is to build bridges between these three different constituencies, between researchers in the World Bank, academic research outside, and our colleagues in operations to partner together to, uh, to, to shed light on, uh, on, on pressing development challenges. In this case, um, and I'd like to start by explicitly thanking Harris and his colleagues on the organizing uh, committee for this conference for drawing together a rich set of partners who are working together to put this event together. Uh, we're working with um, colleagues at George Washington University at the Elliott School of International Affairs and International Economic Policy, um, partnering also with the International Growth Center and also with our colleagues up New York Avenue at the Inter-American uh, Development Bank to bring all of these perspectives together into, into our discussion. So um, I've said more than enough. The um, point of this is to hear uh, the debate and the discussion between researchers and policymakers. So I'll stop here. I'll also excuse myself to go and sit so that I can see where other people speak and unfortunately also sneak out at 9.30, which I apologize for, but I have a, a pre-existing commitment. So uh, wishing all of you um, good luck and thank you very much again for coming to make this conference a success. Um, thank you, Art. Um, as you all know, I mean, being able to do this year in, year out for six years, is, this is not something that we can do alone. So we've been partnering to arrange this conference with other institutions, like Art mentioned, um, GW, uh, George Washington University, the International Growth Center, the Inter-American Development Bank. So with that, uh, I'd like to invite Eric Parado, who's the chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank. He's also the general manager of the research department to give his welcoming remarks. Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, I am impressed about the good audience that we have to talk about this, this interesting topic. And also to see familiar faces in the audience, but also in the panel, like my friend, the, the Mayor Alessandri and, and Professor Benavol. So thank you also for the invitation. Um, on behalf of the organizer, I would like also to welcome you to the sixth edition of this conference. We at the Inter-American Development Bank are very happy to be part of the organizing team this year. 
because we think it's important and, and probably the discussion is going to be remarkable in terms of the insights that we're going to get. There are many reasons we are excited about this conference. I would like to highlight three of them as we start this day of learning, debate and reflection. First, we believe that the area of focus of this conference throughout its six editions, the economy of cities in developing world countries, will be a key to development policy over the next few decades. As you know, Latin America and the Caribbean is the region with a very high levels of urbanization. More than 80% of its people live in cities. This means that many of the defining public policy challenges of this region are already largely urban, including insufficient jobs creation and productivity, crime, environmental sustainability, access to education and health, housing and transport infrastructure deficits, and inclusion of disadvantaged populations. But our region is not alone. Um, a couple of years ago, the global urbanization level crossed the 50% mark. The majority of inhabitants of the world today, and for the first time in history, live in cities. Urbanization will continue to advance rapidly over the next few decades, particularly in Asia and Africa. According to projections by the Marons Institute at NYU, my alma mater, the urban population in the developing world could go from 2.6 million in 2010 to 8 billion in less than a century. In our view, this makes, again, the Latin American experience quite relevant and worth studying. This region urbanized at a much faster pace than the US and Europe did decades before, and in a context where socioeconomic inequality was more extreme and institutions were significantly <coughs> weaker. The lesson left by the successes and failures of Latin American urbanization over the last few decades may prove more relevant than those of the industrialized world for countries like China, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, or South Africa. Second point, and we are excited about the topic of this year's conference, people, markets, and cities. Putting people at the center helps us bring to the table the fact that even though cities continue to be engines of growth throughout the developing world, many are left out of the opportunities they create. Populations of low educated, economically lagging places oftentimes face great obstacles to migrate to the urban centers of opportunity. And even with cit within cities, millions live in the slums and other poorly connected areas, keeping out them away from the opportunity to find a good education, jobs, and better social services. Reading through the program that organizers have prepared for us today, it is clear that at the core of this year's uh, meeting lies the issue of economic and social inclusion. And we believe that this is one of the spaces in which policy can truly make a difference. Third point, we, live, we believe in the power of bringing world-class academics and policy practitioners together to get to know each other, learn from each other, and reflect together on the issues that are of common interest to all of you. We are enthusiastic promoters of evidence-based policy. Rigorous research can truly expand our understanding, correct misconceptions, open our eyes to new realities, and help us look at a familiar problem in a different light. It can help us improve policy. But at the same time, academics can greatly benefit from interacting with policymakers, listening to their experience, and understanding their priorities and the constraints they face. For one, it can help them better understand incentives and constraints that economic agents face on the ground, but it also opens a very special opportunity that of shaping the incentives and constraints that people will face in the future, making a contribution to improve their well-being. And, and I have to add to the formal comments that for us, it's very important to have, for instance, a research department within a multilateral institution. I know that you have an internal discussion within the World Bank regarding this, and I think it's very important, and we have to make the case that it's relevant in terms to join forces, uh, ideas, not only in terms of research, but only in terms of uh, the policy-making process. Uh, multilaterals have a role, and, and, and a key role, I would say, to uh, influence uh, policy-making in all the emerging market economies in, in was as a main focus. We hope that you have an enjoyable and very productive day and that your discussions contribute to develop and disseminate a better understanding of the economy of our cities, their, po their key policy challenges, and the possible solution to these challenges. So with that, I repeat my welcome to you, and thank you very much for, for this. Um, thank you very much, Eric. 
So now we're going to start our debate with a very distinguished uh, panelist on the issue of, which is the central theme of our conference on markets, people, and cities. Now, every year we choose a different topic, and this year we decided to focus on that human dimension in cities, beyond just the physical aspects, whether it's infrastructure or uh, the physical built environment. And this is because cities exist because people have decided to come and live together in the same location, and they do so despite higher housing costs, higher transportation costs. So the fact that they're willing to go through these uh, increases in cost is because of the main benefits that cities bring about, and these are the uh, creation and diffusion of uh, productive knowledge and making agglomeration economies possible. Now, the function of cities to create knowledge and generate agglomeration economy tends to face certain hindrances along the way. One dimension is that a large percentage of workers, specifically in developing country cities, tend to be unskilled, unemployed, or underemployed, and poor. So if cities are to continue to play their role in terms of being engines of economic growth, then jobs and human capital acquisition opportunities need to be made available for a larger share of the population, something that does not exist today in many cities. At the same time, we know that cities in the developing world oftentimes have inefficient spatial structures and poor spatial connectivity which means that workers, in terms of their access to job opportunities uh, and services, tend to be also impeded from having as much access as possible. And finally, the spatial segregation of vulnerable and low-income groups, people with disabilities, ethnic minorities, and a large uh, array of different groups, tend to reinforce the lack of connectivity within a city and prevents, therefore, markets from uh, playing a role to including uh, these population, and therefore we result with a, a sort of spatial and social exclusion within our cities. So I really want to invite our panelists today to reflect on these issues, and we have a great lineup that spans the spectrum of academics and policy makers uh, with us. We have four panelists. Um, I'm going to introduce them um, rapidly. So our first panelist is uh, Felipe Alessandri, who's the mayor of Santiago de Chile, uh, from Chile. He's currently uh, the mayor. He's a lawyer by training, and he has been, since 2004, an elected council member of Santiago, and he's been re-elected in 2012. And his administration focuses on uh, pillars on uh, clean, safe, and organized Santiago. Santiago is a model city, and Santiago for all. Um, we have two uh, distinguished uh, academics with us. Uh, Diane Davis, who's uh, the Charles Dyer Norton Professor of Regional Planning and Urbanism at Harvard University, and she's the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design. Uh, Diane Davis is an urban sociologist by training. She's been at the Graduate School of Design uh, since 2011, and prior to that was at MIT, where she was the head of the International Development Group in DUSP, the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, our um, we have with us uh, Professor Anthony Venables. He's the Professor of Economics and the Director of the Center for the Analysis of Research-Rich Economies at the University of Oxford. Uh, Tony uh, is uh, also a Fellow of the Econometric Society, the Regional Science Association of the British Academy, among many other affiliations. And before, he was uh, the uh, Chief Economist of DFID, as well as the Research Manager of the Trade Group at the World Bank Group, amongst a uh, long-standing distinguished career. And finally, uh, our last panelist uh, is someone who uh, works across the continuum, if you will, of analytics and policy makers. That's Edlam Avera Yemeru. She's the chief of the urbanization sh section at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, based in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia. And Edlam, uh, prior to that, was uh, uh, with uh, UN Habitat, where she led a number of normative and operational programs to promote sustainable urbanization in UN habitat, and therefore in her jobs, she spans this support to policymaker and this continued work on bridging uh, between the two worlds. So we have three questions today that um, make up, um, if you're the composition of this uh, session, so maybe we'll go through them uh, one round at a time. Uh, our first um, question is that which is displayed in front of you, which is how can urban governments facilitate human capital accumulation? 
how can they help that investment in people. So maybe I'm going to ask the panelists in the same order to um, share with us some insights, and then we will go to the second and third question, which will relate to job creation and inclusion. So therefore, we'll you know, cover human capital accumulation, job creation, and inclusion in three rounds, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So maybe, Mayor Alessandri, can I start with you? OK, thank you very much for the invitation, Samea, for everyone. Uh, good morning. I've been mayor for three years. Uh, before I was a councilman, as I may have said. So in Santiago, we have a, a big population. It's a capital of the country. We've been working on how to accumulate human capital. We don't have the resources. Chile is a, a country that's working hard to become a developed country. But what can we do as a city hall, as a municipality? We act as articulating agents to coordinate with with universities, with um, government, national government programs, with uh, MIT Latin America. We're doing a computation program to teach the kids in the high school how to program. And we're working also very hard with NGOs to have especially elderly people, women, and young men that are undereducated, most of them immigrants. We've had a for the last six years, a big issue with immigrants. That, that all of them live in the center part of the city. So we're working hard because small companies don't have the money to invest in their workers because it's too expensive. For, for example, we have a big, a big um, university district in Santiago called Barrio Universitario, where we have over 100 universities, uh, professional centers, and we make partnerships as a city hall with them to make special programs for our elderly people, for women and for young men, in order to um, give them the education they need for special employees that are, for example, nowadays running in Santiago and in the world. And it's been a, a great success. We also work with national uh, government programs we are face to face with the citizens, so we uh, try to make those programs work, and especially with with the younger kids too, and elderly people. So we've been with different programs, with uh, NGOs, with different entities, but always acting as a coordinator. Uh, the city hall makes its partnerships, and we work um, with universities, with tech. Uh, um, schools to give for free. Huh? Most of the time we pay or we made a special partnership agreement in order to, for those educational institutes to receive the, uh, the citizens and make them some special courses for them. And after that, we try to employ, employ the, the, the people that went to those classes. We have special ones for women, older people, huh? Chile, each time uh, the older population is growing very fast. And also um, immigrants that have arrived, especially from Venezuela, Haiti, Colombia, and Peru. That's a big uh, thing that's happened over the last six years, probably. And we have to react for that and make them to have uh, stable employees. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Professor Davis. Thanks. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. It's lovely to have this great set of minds in this room talking about this very important issue. I'm going to start by, by hopefully not, not like airing any dirty laundry here, but when we were thinking about this panel, the original question that was sent around was, how can urban governance, governments facilitate human capital accumulation? And I was so happy about that, to hear that that was the frame of the question here. Um, because I thought, there are a lot of economists here, but we really need to think about people who know something about governance. I'm glad we have a mayor on the panel. I'm bringing this up because I want to underscore, even though I understand how we've changed the um, frame of the question just to facilitate a more robust conversation, maybe to talk about private sector um, involvement and not just public sector involvement, that. Um, a city is not an actor, 
and a city has a, ver a variety of institutions that act within it, and one of the most important institutions are the urban governments, the governments that act within the institution. So that, that's my first point. So we can't even start thinking about human capital accumulation without understanding the conditions that governments create for private sector firms to make decisions. Um, my second point would be that I, I also want us to make sure in this panel and today that we think about territorial scales in a more complex way. So if we think about governance or public sector activities that lay the framework for private sector decisions about investment and employment, et cetera, there are multiple scales we have to be thinking about. There's the, well, first there's global economic policy, trade, et cetera, but there's national governments. They lay the framework for education, good or bad. Um, there are city governments, which may have the authority to, to kind of make decisions about education, but may not have decisions. Things like credit access, maybe those are not in the hands of the city government, but they're in you know, the central bank, et cetera. And then there are, of course, the scale, the suburban scale communities. Or there are there municipalities and delegaciones that are also involved in setting the framework. And I think that one thing, building a little bit on what the mayor has said, that some of the challenges triangulating different demographics and stakeholders together to kind of learn from each other, understand, make connections, et cetera. And I think some of that is done at a, at a scale smaller than the city itself. And so I just want to put on the table the, the way that we territorial frame any of the policies that get, that that we end up discussing here, because it's not necessarily obvious at what scale which policy should be promoted. Thanks. Um, thank you, Diane. Uh, Professor Venables. Good. Um, let me obviously start by thanking the organizers. Um, it's good, good, good to be back uh, in Washington. Um, how long do I have? <laughs> no. Um, Okay, the starting point, I guess, is yeah, primary, secondary education. I'm gonna take that as critically important and given for the purposes of this discussion and think more about the vocational side, you know, build, building up skills, skill, skills for work. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanna focus on. And I want first to think about what's working in the way cities are, are building up, are, are accumulating human capital, and then think about a few of the areas where perhaps it's not working, and possibly how uh, yeah, policy responses might, might, might be framed. Okay, so what, what, what is working? Well, I think if you go to pretty much any decent-sized city in the world, uh, you will see adverts everywhere for colleges, for secretarial, English language, accountancy, administrative jobs, white-collar jobs. Right? So there's a sector that seems to me to really be working. There's a, you know, there's uh, a private market, sometimes with, 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 with state support, sometimes with dubious quality, but, but nevertheless, there's a real uh, demand and supply uh, for, for skills uh, in, in that area, and that, that seems to be working. Why, why in that area? Um, well, I guess, guess it's, if you think about it, I guess it's a couple of things. First, these are skills that don't particularly require on-the-job training. They can be done you know, in, in colleges, uh, in, in the classroom. Uh, so that's, that's easy. Uh, second, they're transferable skills. So if I acquire one of those skills, um, well, there's a big market for it, uh, plenty of employers, and I can take the skill around different places. So, yeah. That seems to be working. Cities building up skills. Uh, what about other contexts? Yeah, I'll st start with something that's working, but let's move on to some of the areas that are more pro problematic, uh, where things aren't working. Well, you know, you brought an economist here, so it, it's going to be two classic market failures uh, in in education, where things really aren't working. Uh, and so let me say a couple of words about each of those. The first of the classic market failures, of course, is that firms uh, don't have sufficient incentive to train workers 
because having trained them, they quit. Yeah, there, there's turnover. We don't live in a slave society. You can't make workers post bonds to repay their, 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 their training costs. So, so, so a classic externality or market failure uh, that firms don't have uh, sufficient incentives. And I guess that applies particularly when it's on-the-job training. Uh, so it has to be done in the firm. can't be you know, separated off uh, and done in a classroom. And just reflecting on it, I mean, what, what, what sectors do we think this is biting in? Um, I guess quite a lot of sort of factory work, pretty routine factory work. I was very struck by, there's this recent work by uh, my colleague Stefan Durkan and others on um, textile firms uh, in, in Addis Ababa, uh, in Ethiopia, where the turnover rates, the labor turnover rates, are, are astonishingly high. I'd, I'd naively thought of, you know, formal sector jobs, good. But no, formal sector jobs, rather bad. People work in them for a couple of weeks and, and move on. So they've done experiments there and, you know, tracked training. And training just gets dissipated enormously fast because most people quit. Um, so, you know, it's clearly a problem in that sort of factory sector in some countries. I think it's probably a critical problem in the construction sector where, you know, a lot of, I mean, you need on-the-job training, uh, but essentially casual labor markets in, 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 in many countries. So again, just un under investment in skills by, by employers. Um, what do we do about it? We, um, government, city, uh, city, city governments. Well, I guess one thing is um, to try and create better jobs. So, you yeah, know, bring, bring down turnover. Um, better jobs... Um, in the sense of you know, pay, job conditions, better jobs in the city organisation. I mean, a lot of the problem here is you know, people have to commute two hours to get to, to work and two hours back. Then surprise, surprise, they're going you know, gonna to be high job turnover. People don't like that. So I think there are you know, th 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 things that can be done to try and stabilise turnover um, in which you know, the city has a role, certainly insofar as it might be commuting to work, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the other thing, I suppose, the obvious thing an economist would say is internalize the externality. So really, um, there are many firms each suffering this problem, but if they collectively got together to try and organize training, you know, industry-wide apprenticeship programs uh, and all that, um, that would be one way of addressing the problem and surely a way where, a, a route where government has a big, big role to play, both in securing the coordination uh, and in funding it. So I think that's really important. Um, there are people who know a lot about vocational training of that sort. I know nothing, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say it's important and move on. Okay, so that, that's one area where there, 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 there are problems. Uh, the other one, I think, you know, the, the other market failure um, is, is it, it's almost the, 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 the converse. It's a situation where workers don't have sufficient incentive uh, to get trained, essentially because you know, they don't know what jobs are out there, or maybe if even if jobs are out there, there's only one or two employers, so they're going to be held up. Um, they're not going to be able to get the full you know, market value for their skills because there's, a, there's a, a monopsony purchaser of their skills. Um, what sort of context do I think that might apply in? Well, I guess it's things... Fairly specialist things, um, sort of engineering, uh, may, maybe software, maybe not. Anyway, en engineering things, uh, skills like that, where, where workers uh, don't have uh, the, the, the incentive. Uh, response to that, so what, what's, if, if you want to try and address that market failure uh, and improve skills, uh, what responses might you be thinking of? Well, one, I guess, is government to really work with firms in trying to identify you know, potential areas of you know, future, future demand. Um, but it's hard, you know, sort of picking winners, which we know, you know governments generally aren't very good at. But still, it, it needs to be done. You need, you know, government obviously needs to work with firms in making some sort of manpower planning. You know, where, where, where is this needed? Uh, what other responses? Um, immigration. Um, key workers are uh, complements, not substitutes uh, for local employment. If you're going to think, think you're going to have a skills shortage, then you know, bring in uh, people from outside the city, out, out, outside the country, uh, to fill the gap. And a final point, 
um, or final, yeah, un, un, under this heading, well, I'm finally final. Uh, focus, yeah, really think about sectors where you know that, that there's a skill shortage and there will be a demand. And that brings me back to construction again. You know, construction is an area where we know there are critical shortages of skilled workers. You know, Chinese workers are doing jobs, uh, jobs in Africa. Whereas, you know, construction, there surely will be a demand to build cities as cities get built. Um, it's surely important that you have skilled labor doing it because these are durable, so you want to build durable structures of a decent quality. It's surely important that you bring down, you know, it's a crit critical investment good. You want to do it well, cheaply, effectively. So once again, skills there, you know, big, big area to build employment, quality investment, uh, and skill accumulation. Thank you, Tony. And lastly, Edla. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and I'm uh, pleased to be here with you this morning. As indicated, I'm coming from the UN Economic Commission for Africa, so much of my intervention will actually try to shed light on uh, the dynamics in the African region, not only because I'm working there, but because um, one can say that it's really the last frontier for urbanization, uh, being the least urbanized region globally, yet the fastest, uh, with the fastest urban growth. And of course, the magnitude of the challenges are equally um, significant. So just a little bit of context, and I think context matters a lot, and I suppose that's why we are here to share different experiences. Um, there are a number of things that are peculiar about urbanization in Africa. Well, first off, it's still a majority rural continent. 60% uh, is still rural. Uh, this may be known to a number of you, but I'd, I'd still like to highlight them because it shapes what I'll say uh, thereafter. But of course, it's a continent with a very fast urban growth rate. So by 2035, 50% of Africans will live in urban areas. Um, other um, aspects of Africa's urbanization, the urban growth has outpaced or is outpacing economic growth. And Africa is urbanizing under conditions of poverty, very low income compared to how other regions have urbanized. And critically also, the region is urbanizing without um, industrializing in a sense, where in industrialization is still very weak and uh, stagnant. And so I think these dynamics have a very direct implication uh, for the questions and the issues that we'll be discussing today. Um, so what does the human capital situation look like? Clearly, there is a very huge deficit, and I think the World Bank's Human Capital Index itself shows that the lowest ranked 40 countries, 36 of them are from Africa. And I think it would be particularly interesting to look at how um, the results look like with disaggregation. And I think it was previously mentioned that there is an interest to actually begin to disaggregate the Human Capital Index. And of course, more than 70% of employment in Africa is actually informal. So when we're talking about human capital, <laughs> Uh, development in African cities or Africa in general, we're actually talking about a labor force that's largely informal. And again, I think that contextualizes the kind of solutions that we can begin to talk about. And it's also a context where firms, which um, Professor Van Alves was, was speaking about quite a lot, face very significant challenges in terms of uh, um, being able to, 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 to uh, get access to an educated and a skilled workforce. Um, so human capital development for Africa is really a very serious agenda, particularly because the region is now um, vigorously trying to pursue structural transformation, which is a priority to transform the economies towards more productive sectors of manufacturing and modern services. But how do you do that with such huge human capital um, deficits where you're actually um, facing challenges in terms of trained and skilled uh, labor being available? for a transformed economy. So in a sense, there's a mismatch between the desired structural transformation of African economies and the kind of human capabilities and skills uh, that are available. So just, just quickly on what are the kind of um, actions uh, that could be taken by urban governments. By, by myself, um, Professor Davis, I also found the question quite intriguing, but for different reasons, which I will come to when we look at the second question. Urban governments. In our work, what we're finding is that uh, as important as urban governments and local governments are, and uh, of course uh, the mayor is here with us today, national governments are perhaps 
equally, if not more important than Africa. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that a bit later on. So I think that applies to all the questions we'll look at. So what are the things that um, urban governments could, could look at? Of course, first is to understand where is the need? What is it that we're looking at when we talk about human capital? in African cities. And as I said earlier, it's a largely informal economy. Africa's urbanization is largely informal. So we're looking at low-skilled, semi-skilled labor force, um, and that's, that's how we should tailor our interventions. And a key, a key issue to look at is how to match the skills and labor in African cities with the kind of productive sectors that national government is trying to push for. And so we have, cl I mean, I think the case of Addis Ababa was mentioned, but Ethiopia is now, as an example, pursuing very, very sort of aggressively an industrialization policy and establishing many industrial parks in and around cities and urban areas. And there is a huge challenge around um, getting skilled labor, and of course retention is a challenge. Linked to that are, of course, many other issues around uh, the kind of infrastructure that's needed to, to uh, support a growing industrial labor force. And so these are all issues that are becoming somewhat of a challenge because, uh, and again, I'll speak to this uh, later, the silos, because these decisions are not just made at the urban government level. The national government is pushing for industrial parks, whereas local governments and urban governments have no say, are not consulted, and so it's in the aftermath that the actual realities of how do you um, make la a skilled labor force available, where do you house such a labor force, what are the implications around human capital development, the silos around policy making, national, local, and national development and sector, economic sector policies, actually is a major challenge for human capital um, development when uh, countries are pursuing structural transformation. And so, of course, for Africa, the push is towards labor-intensive industrialization, labor-intensive int modern services. So these are the areas where local governments should really be looking at more closely. And linked to this, of course, is what to do with the informal sector. And I think that's, we, we can't really divorce any question around human capital accumulation from the informal sector in Africa. Uh, and this is where a lot of skills development and investment is needed beyond broader support for the informal sector to uh, eventually transition uh, into a sort of um, being part of the value chains of manufacturing and modern services in African cities is absolutely crucial. So I think I go back to my point around what are we actually looking at? Context matters, and I think these specificities in Africa make it um, very, very particular when we look at uh, the kind of interventions. Uh, two final points. One is around um, the constraints that actually workers face in African cities. I think Professor Van Alves, uh referred to that um, as well transportation costs, mobility is such a huge constraint that it actually directly impacts the way in which uh, workers in, in our cities in Africa are able to uh, be part of the productive economy or not. And of course, the other is housing and a number of other infrastructure and services. But I think transport mobility is really at the core of, of whether workers um, in African cities today are, are able to uh, benefit from any economic uh, transition that uh, the cities undergo. A final point, as I said earlier, really the silos are a major challenge. Coordination between national and local governments, between national development planning and sector policies and strategies have a direct impact on the evolution of urban economies and within that context, the kind of jobs that are created in cities or not, and the ways in which human capital um, is evolving in African cities. So, that, uh, that to me is also uh, an issue that really needs closer uh, consideration uh, in this regard. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you, Edlam. I think we've heard um, lots of great insights. I mean, we've heard from the mayor about you know, the important roles that city play, and this is despite having you know, in certain contexts limited competences and in most of the time limited resources with which to operate uh, in this space. We've heard from Professor Davis about the role of local governments and the territorial scale in which we operate, and that very much echoes the notion of the mayor's wedge, which some of our work on city competitiveness have uncovered, which is when we look at the um, large array of policies by which uh, we can support city com uh, competitiveness, we find that mayors actually have limited space within which to operate, and despite that, they innovate a lot. So, I mean, they find 
mayors find themselves operating, you know, on context of policies, on institutional, on regulation dimensions, many of which could be at national level, maybe land and infrastructure, they tend to influence them a lot, skills development, as you've heard, there are dimensions that they that are within the mayor's wedge and others that will uh, require interventions by other levels of government, and of course, access to finance is another um, area of confidence. And I think Adlam drew on this and, and echoed the notion of the importance role of national governments in there so that you can have an array of interventions across different levels of government um, and actually in, in many ways at the World Bank in our uh, latest urban strategy we evolved the thinking from the central focus on urban local governments to a notion of city leaders to really echo uh, the you know the important message that intervention within a city space requires, like Professor Davis mentioned, a large array of actors, including uh, local but also national governments, in terms of creating the enabling environment. Uh, Professor uh, Venables raised the important market failures about the incentives to firms and to workers. Um, maybe something we haven't heard much about. I think we focused quite a bit on um, education and on skills. I mean, we've heard less about other dimensions of human um, capital accumulation. Of course, health, which is particularly important, cities and issues of air pollution and the way they impact worker productivity. Uh, and moreover, and even firm location decisions is critical. Stunting, for instance, and the way it's going to influence tomorrow's uh, labor force and, and issues of social safety nets, but that's you know, um, a very vast uh, topic within which to operate. Maybe if you switch to our second question, I think Edlam got us a good head start on this one, which is what can cities do to facilitate job creation? Because she started in her last two points to bring the issues of transportation and mobility, and she spoke about the coordination challenges. So why don't we go in the reverse order this time? Edlam, you know, pick up where you left, and then we'll go to Professor Venables, Professor Davis, and then Mayor Arsand. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, this is an issue that we work on quite a lot uh, at ECA, but in the Africa region, because it's really at the core of the whole structural transformation agenda that Africa is prioritizing. If you sort of narrow it down and unpack it, it comes down to urban jobs, because uh, the pursuit of manufacturing and modern services, those are largely urban-based. And so in the end, we are talking about urban jobs when we talk about structural um, transformation in Africa. And as I said earlier, um, the focus is on labor-intensive um, sectors of the economy that can generate sufficient productive uh, employment. But here's where I want to elaborate my earlier point that we find that uh, in our work, the strategies and policies and investments that directly shape urban job creation a lot of them actually take place outside the urban sector, per se. And a lot of those decisions are made not at the local level. So, um, and let me, let me just elaborate a bit more. So, in, in a lot of African countries today, um, we've sort of gone back to national development planning and long-term visioning, which kind of fell out of fashion in the 90s and early 2000s, but it's come back now as a means of uh, pursuing structural transformation. And this is how top priorities and economic sector targeting is decided, is through national development planning. And so through our work, we thought, let's not look at the national urban policy per se, which is the sector policy. Let's look at urban in national development planning. And it's very revealing. In as much as the prioritization of urbanization as an economic driver is, is gaining prominence in Africa, at least in terms of the narrative, in terms of global commitments, etc., the reality is national development planning in Africa is not strategically positioning urbanization as a driver of economic growth. And this is where we see a major challenge because economic sector policies and strategies, investment priorities are decided largely through national development planning. And so what we found in terms of how urbanization is articulated in national development planning is it's largely seen as a challenge. It's largely seen as a trend that needs to be slowed down, which is of course not possible. Um, it's largely looked at as service delivery agenda, not as an economic agenda. It's mostly seen as a local level issue and most critically as a social issue rather than economic issue. 
And so this is the way that it's articulated in national development planning, which we see to be a major barrier. And that leads to very serious disconnects between spatial and economic planning. I think, well, Sami, you were referring to agglomeration economies and um, how to leverage them for economic transformation. But actually, the, the policy silos and, this, and the disconnects mean that uh, investments and, and policies are, are actually um, formulated and, 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 and um, implemented in, in the sort of disconnected ways. So what are the sort of uh, recommendations? I'm focusing on national governments here because um, we feel that that is really complementary to the um, vast amount of analysis that already exists as to what local governments can do and urban governments can do and the challenges of urbanization. We feel the real bottleneck is around national development planning and economic sector policies and strategies. So just very quickly, one is economic sector targeting in national development planning, which is where the priority sectors are actually identified um, and prioritized. So without naming the country, we are working with one country in Africa which is now working out on their new national development plan. And the sectors that were prioritized were minerals, oil, and agricultural uh, development. All very critical, of course. But the question is, to what extent can these sectors create urban jobs? Minerals, oil, and agricultural development. And so when you start to unpack it in that way, it, it, it becomes clear that actually urban job creation per se is not explicitly seen as a target. Agricultural development is crucial for Africa, but there is a huge opportunity through rural, rural urban value chains to promote urban jobs. But that kind of perspective is not necessarily explicit, which means that the sectors that are prioritized through economic sector targeting may not actually lead to urban job creation. The other is around looking at uh, investments, for example, infrastructure investments. A lot of the key decisions on what type of infrastructure, national infrastructure, for example, take place outside the urban sector. But they have a direct implication on how cities uh, evolve, how urban economies evolve, and the kind of jobs that can be created uh, within, the, um, with, within the African cities. So spatial targeting of infrastructure investments needs to be an explicit priority also in national uh, development um, planning. The other is through national development planning and sector targeting, it's important to prioritize sectors that are growing, where demand is growing because of rapid urbanization. The areas such as construction, which Professor Van Alps mentioned, housing uh, and others can actually help us to promote labor intensive um, jobs uh, in the context of our cities. But that also needs to be explicit, where urban growth and urbanization is seen as an opportunity to uh, promote domestic manufacturing and value chains. For example, food processing. The type of foods consumed, the way in which food is consumed in African cities is transforming rapidly, but we're not really looking at that linked to agricultural transformation, linked to value chain promotion, et cetera. So again, the disconnects. My final point, which can't be emphasized um, enough, is data, data disaggregation. And what we find is that while there is quite a, quite a lot of data on the social and demographic dimensions of urbanization in Africa, we know close to nothing about the economic dynamics, the economic aspects of um, urbanization in Africa. And I think in this context, it becomes very difficult to, to talk about you know, job creation and, and promoting employment. Yeah. So apologies. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Venables. Yeah, as as Edlam has said, this is the, the the big one, the big issue, the the the, the core, obviously, uh, job creation, in general and in in cities in particular. Um, as I start thinking about this, I I, I like to make a, a distinction between two two drivers of of, of jobs uh, in general uh, and in cities in particular, perhaps. One is. Um, job creation in non-tradable sectors. What I mean by that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's the largest share of jobs, but it's essentially, you know, the city serving itself or its immediate hinterland or perhaps the, 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 the whole country, but not, not the internationally traded goods, okay? And the other type of job, uh, the internationally tradable. Uh, so maybe export opportunities, maybe import substituting opportunities, 
but um, actually, you know, creating sort of new, new, new jobs, not just ser serving the, the own economy, but, uh, but, but reaching out. I find that a very useful uh, distinction uh, in, in thinking about these things. Let me say a little bit about job creation in each of those sectors. Uh, broad, probably the sectors, very broad aggregates, non-tradables, tradables. Non-tradables, um, well, I think a lot of you know, regional policy in developed countries and perhaps you know, some, some of the urban policies we're talking about here um, really end up doing more for non-tradables than tradables. But of course, that's just moving stuff around. It's just shuffling stuff around the country. You know, if there's a fixed amount of expenditure uh, on, on non-tradables, then all you're doing by you know, growing this sector in my city is you know, probably shrinking it in somebody else's. Um, so caution, you know, when you start thinking about this, you know, I find it really helpful to have that non-tradable, tradable distinction uh, in, in my head. It can be overstated, of course. They're old lump of labor fallacies and things. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, m maybe attracting you know, non-tradable non stuff is associated with raising productivity in the sector and bringing down costs. So, so it can be overstated, but I think it's, there, there, there's a word of caution, you know, displacement, moving, just moving jobs around. You think you're creating jobs, but really all you're doing is moving them around. Um, so big, big word of caution on that. Okay, but what about tradables? So this is actually growing your export sector or import competing or whatever, really uh, do, doing new things. Uh, how do you do that? How can cities uh, facilitate uh, creation of jobs in those sort of activities? Well, I suppose, yeah, the, 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 this is the big one. It's very difficult. Um, again, the way I think about it is, yeah, the environment, the city, um, has to meet many more or less necessary conditions to make it attractive for investment. But even if all those necessary conditions have met, they're not been met, they're not necessarily jointly sufficient. So it's very difficult to do, very difficult to do research on, uh, really figuring out what works. But what are these necessary conditions? I'm calling them, calling them necessary conditions. Well, I think uh, my IGC colleague, uh, John Sutton, has done more yeah, thoughtful, excellent work on this than uh, anyone else I know. So let me run through his list of what, 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 what he thinks matters uh, for, for attracting uh, investment. Um, first on the list, oh, well, in no particular order, in, in the order I'm going to read them out, first on the list, uh, sort of phys physical environment things, or to be specific, land, logistics, and power. You know, obviously, you need land as an input, uh, if you want agglomeration economies, you probably want quite a large piece of land so that it's, um, uh, you know, firms can uh, congregate there. Uh, logistics, so that's, you know, transport infrastructure, logistics, but also I would add to that accessibility for workers. So it's, you know, connectedness, uh, slightly broader than logistics, and obviously electric power as well, uh, absolutely essential. There's that. Next on his list are removing obstacles. Um, yeah, an old agenda in, in yeah, development economics, obviously removing uh, yeah, regulatory barriers uh, to, to, to investment. And really importantly on his list is absolute government commitment, you know, working with firms um, and being committed, you know, not just saying we're going to do this, going to do that, but really um, being credible, being committed, uh, government being there for the, for the duration uh, to, to make these things work and to see them through. So I think those are the things that he sees as being absolutely critical in getting, uh, in making a place uh, attractive for investment in these sort of, you know, potentially footloose tradable activities. Something, you know, very interesting and very important raised by Ed Lem that I imagine Diane might be talking about in a moment is, of course, the interaction between national uh, and local government in doing this. Um, you know, some national government might have a policy for special economic zones, um, but really needs to be talking to cities about uh, whether they want them and where they put them and so on. But I'll hand on to, to other people, possibly to talk about that. Professor Davis. I know we're getting short on time, and there's supposed to be a third question, which I'm super interested ah. in about inclusion. But let me just say quickly, and I'm not an economist, it's probably obvious already, 
So this may not actually be the best question for me, but I do want to say something about framing the question and link the second question to the first question, which is, I think, well, people have been thinking about job creation since yeah, forever. It's a problem not just in the developing world, it's a problem in the United States, it's a serious problem. I'm all, all behind thinking about job creation. But I do think it's important to frame it in terms of not just any old job. So l let's just think about the types of jobs we're creating and not just focus on job creation. And that starts shifting one to ask different questions. So the first, I would say that um, I didn't say much in response to the kind of my understanding of human capital formation, but I think we want to connect job creation to human capital formation. They, in theory, are implicitly, but let, let's not silo the questions. Human capital formation has to do with creating conditions that make residents employable and healthy. And some of the, I think Anthony mentioned about construction there. Once we start thinking about creating jobs that also facilitate human capital accumulation, we start changing the way we think, not just an opportunistic sector, but there are certain things that should be prioritized. Third point I would make in building on, on uh, Dr. Yemero's comment about formal and informal, and I know I don't need to say this is such an old debate, but like, let's not just only think about formal job creation because it's not going to be the only answer. So, and I know there's a kind of strategy to move towards formal job creation, but let's not forget when we're framing up a human capital formation that informal job creation is very important and needs to be made better. I, I, I can't help but um, put on the table because it's come up a couple times and if we get a chance I'll talk about it in the next question, the issue of transportation and mobility. I've just finished a big um, project funded by the Volvo Research and Educational Foundation looking at innovations in transportation. One of our case studies was in Mexico City. We're now working in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the problem of transportation is really a terrible problem. It's getting in the way of human capital formation. There are responses with job creation to deal with the transportation sector, but let's remember, and we did one of these case studies in our project, that Uber was an informal activity before it became formal. So I think it's really important to kind of think about our distinctions between formal and informal, think about the legal context in which we might facilitate certain types of jo job creation that we might not have in the past because we are thinking about solving other problems that affect human capital formation. My last point um, is um, about the framing of job creation not through the lens of the um, firm and not, oh, let's just say, not merely through the lens of the firm and not merely through the lens of the sector, although I understand very much the point, but through the lens of the city. And this is where I want to land on that this is a good framing of this question. How can cities facilitate job creation? Thinking, obviously, this will re require governments, urban and national, but how can we think about what are the projects of the city that need to get built for the future of that city that can also create jobs? This means not only investment in just remediating transport systems, you know, green infrastructure, rainwater harvesting, ecological development, the restru spatial restructuring of cities is an absolute necessity for, for sustainability, for the future of the planet, as well as for human capital accumulation. So that should be the framing. And then think about what, what projects can provide jobs that also solve a set, another problem at the same time. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Davis. Leonard Sandri. Thank you. The official figure of unemployment in Santiago, it's around 7%, mainly young men. What, we're, what we are doing as a city hall is bring the job to the people. Now in Santiago, I have an employment fair or employment expo, we call it, where I went to 100 different companies and talked to them. And we are doing right by the, our presidential palace, where 2.5 million people come every day, every day at the downtown area. and we put up this uh, employment expo with more than 5,000 jobs. It's important, mainly, you, you can see every day, long lines of people willing to have a job. It's been very good. We do this twice or three times a year. Also, as Anthony was saying, removing obstacles. If you want to build, construct a building, if you want to uh, put a restaurant, 
any entrepreneur that wants to install in Santiago, he has to pass through the city hall. Before, you could take months, almost a year, to have a permit to sell a beer uh, or a Chilean wine that's excellent. Huh? Now, <laughs> we're um, doing everything so in no more than 90 days, you have all the permits for whatever employment you want to install in Santiago, if you want to build a restaurant, uh, a kindergarten, whatever, to removing obstacles. It's fundamental. In, in Latin American countries, the bureaucracy is so big for everything. If you want a driver's license, before you took, I don't know, a whole day. Now in an hour, you can have your driver's license. We have certificated more over 100 processes in the ISO 9001 process to make things fast. That's very good. Also. I come again, What's, I, I installed a program called uh, Fair Co Commerce Program for the immigrants. Because there's over 100,000 immigrants in Santiago that don't have their documents in order. So they, for living, they start an informal business, uh, illegal vendors selling food, uh, mainly, I don't know, Peruvian ceviche or sushi or Chilean sopaipillas, whatever. Uh, in the streets, completely illegal. So I've done a program where, with the national government, I talked to the president, and we said to all these guys, come here in a big stadium and put your papers in order. It doesn't matter if you came into the country by an illegal pass, if your visa, you run out of the visa, come here and put your papers in order. Because in Chile, without your ID, you don't exist. If you want to rent the house for living with your family, the landlord abuses with you because you have no documents. So instead of charging you, I don't know, $300, the monthly lease is around $1,000. And you cannot have your kids in the kindergarten or schools. So come here. We're not going to send you out of the country, but put your papers in order. And we've done special areas in town where they can sell their food or whatever they want, but uh, fulfilling all of the requirements, health requirements if they're selling food, uh, uh, helping them, for example, to have food trucks if they want to sell uh, food in different fairs of the city, helping these immigrants first to regulate their papers in order and, and helping them to, to have a job, maybe an informal job, as Diane was saying, but fulfilling all of the requirements. If you eat their food, you're not going to get sick of anything, the food, what happened before. It's a hard job, but little by little, step by step, um, they are understanding that informality is not the way. We have one hand that's strong well, with the police officers, with the illegal vendors, we take them out of the streets, but on the other hand, they say, come here, we'll help you. Uh, put your papers in order, and then we'll help you have a job or at least if you want to be an entrepreneur and have your own uh, cookery or whatever, we will help you have those papers in order, in order that you can do your business and have uh, uh, money for your family. It's working little by little. It's difficult because uh, the people from Haiti, for example, have a, a language difficulty, they speak Creole. So we are teaching the uh, municipal officials to speak Creole. It's a derivation of French. It's pretty tough. But little by little, we're making the change, and it's coming up good. good. Thank you. Um, we have a third question. I'm going to encroach a little bit on the coffee break, but maybe you know our third question was on inclusion and what can cities um, do, or you know, urban local governments do as well to help as cities become inclusive. Maybe two minutes per speaker, and that way we can leave you a good seven minutes for the coffee break. This time we start with Professor Davis. Well, again, I'm going to do a framing thing. I want to make sure you had said at the beginning that you had talked about social and economic inclusion. But to me, what's really important for our discussion today is the spatial inclusion. Now, I know you've talked about that in the past. But I do think that um, the problem of kind of urbanization, I work mostly in Latin America, although I've done a little in, in, in Africa as well, um, the issue of sprawl and the kind of um, gr growth of cities, it's, it's been actually... Um, 
gotten worse with neoliberalization because then there's kind of changing property markets that push people out farther and there's no transportation, et cetera. I think the issue of thinking about spatial planning, the spatial form of the city is front stage and center in making cities more exclusive. So that, that's a real quick answer. Transportation is an important part of that. I also think that there are new um, property rights regulations to be thought about, community land trusts, et cetera. There are a whole series of things that should be on the agenda to think about restructuring the spatial form of the city. That is the agenda, and it could be done sustainably, but it needs to be done whatever way. The second thing I'd also put on the table, because it's another project I've been working on for the last 10, 15 years, is, is the problem of violence, which is related to spatial segregation. Attention needs to be paid to the problem of violence reduction because violence, the kind of threat and the reality of violence is what drives spatial exclusion, gating, moving people out, and that has a, it's a vicious cycle. It, it creates impoverished pockets without accessibility, with no jobs, et cetera, and that's where violence flowers. So those are just a couple issues I put on the table quickly. Professor Davis, uh, Mayor Alessandri, two minutes. Thanks. One of the basis of my program is, is inclusive Santiago. It's been hard because Chile, it's like an island. Up north, we have the Atacama Desert, on the south, the Antarctica, the Pacific Ocean, and the Andes. And with the immigrants, things have changed. People in, in Chile are very bored. They uh, were dressed in gray, not very good for parties, hardworking people. And imagine people are coming from Venezuela, Colombia, Haiti, Caribbean music, rum. So there's been a xenophobic, it's been a, no, now in the cities when you walk, I have election next year, they tell me, Mayor, Mayor, please expel of the, all of these guys from, from, from the city because they, they do parties at Thursday, Friday, Saturday, some especially, uh, so it's difficult. What are we doing? Integration in schools. Peep, uh, kids don't make differences at all. So I run all of the public schools in Santiago, a lot of integration there. And inserting the community, also the parents, so they know about our idiosyncrasy. Now we are celebrating, for example, the, in September our national days and so independence. So we, we teach them about our traditions so we can live together. It's difficult because um, the cultures are very difficult, are di very different. We're also doing, as Diane was saying, housing for immigrants in the middle of the city. We don't want to take them two hours apart. In the middle, for lease, for a period of <coughs> about two years, we also have an immigration office in Santiago that the officials speak Creole, uh, and they receive the people, they guide them in all of the process of regulation. And this housing for immigrants, first of all, they were resisted by the other uh, neighbors because they said, oh, it's going to be a, a party uh, the whole time. But now we're changing that, and people are very happy that the people from Venezuela that are running from a very difficult moment in their country are coming to Santiago. People from Haiti, hardworking people, are also um, fluently coming every day more part of the community. It's been a hard job, but we're doing a, a fairly good job as well. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Imeru. Okay, thank you. Um, I think for me, um, both aspects, the social and economic, are important. And I, I, I often find that when we talk about inclusion, we sort of, um, at least as, as far as I, I've experienced it, we focus on the social aspects, which are absolutely fundamental and linked to the economic. But economic inclusion is equally important. And I think in our, in our at least, where, I, where I'm coming from, um, a key yardstick for inclusive growth is actually whether economic growth is job rich or not. And I think this is an agenda that is important for us in Africa, where economic growth has been quite rapid, but its ability to create jobs at scale, decent jobs, has been very limited. And the same applies at the city level as well. Just a few uh, priorities uh, from my perspective. I can't also emphasize enough the issue of mobility and transport, which uh, not only is a major um, uh, driver of exclusion in our cities, but also it's a cost for households. 
where as much as 16, 17% of household income is spent on transport. It's a cost for the cities. Uh, we we're just discussing some issues with the city of Kampala, and they were telling us, well, actually your figures are outdated. We estimate 800,000 to a million dollars is, is, is uh, lost every day in Kampala because of um, traffic jams. So public transport is, is just a major issue that uh, we need to look at in our cities very, very closely. And I don't think it's always a question of not having the resources. It's a question of prioritizing mass transport and also uh, non-motorized forms of transport. The other for me is public space. Again, I think this is an issue that I cannot emphasize enough because we have cities that are fast becoming just concrete jungles and the issue of public space is not adequately emphasized. And it's not a question of cost again. So we can't say it's because we can't afford to have public space. That's not the issue. It's a question of prioritization. Final point is around residential and social segregation uh, and the issue of you know, pockets of poverty and prosperity in our cities, which are perpe especially perpetuated by uh, private developers. So there's an issue of regulating you know, spatial form and spatial layout in our cities to make sure that we don't uh, actually exacerbate um, exclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Venables, the final word. Yeah, very briefly. Um, what are the main barriers to inclusion in the labor market? Um, some regulatory, I think, and some geographical. So regulatory, um, yeah allow the informal sector to thrive, encourage small businesses. You want to pull people out of that sector, not push them out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a regulatory, you, know, you need the environment to include, enable people to be included in that informal labor market. Um, geographically, yeah, as people have already said, uh, you need good transport, you need dense cities, you need people to be able to access jobs. Um, read last week's Economist on some rather sad English suburbs of English cities um, and you'll get a pretty good sense for people being uh, excluded by geography and urban design. So then thank you very oh, much. Oh, sorry, and oh. there are people from uh, Cape Town here, I know, who uh, clearly think about geography uh, and urban layout uh, as a rather major factor in exclusion. Sorry. Thank you, and with that, I think I'd like to ask the audience to join me in a round of applause for our distinguished panel. And I think now there is a coffee break or what's left of it, so I'll let the organizer to... We started 15 minutes late. Well,